You know, we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. We shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. This quote, being said here by the famous American media philosopher Marshall McLuhan, is often used to describe the way we become influenced by our tools, and most of all by our own media consumption. Think of books, radio, TV, social media, and all the other ways that our thinking has been shaped throughout the past centuries. I run a digital communication agency, I've studied digital media, I've worked in digital media for over 15 years. In Marshall McLuhan's words has also influ have also influenced my own thinking. And so I hope you can imagine how surprised I was when I found out that Marshall McLuhan actually never said these words. And even though he's often referenced and quoted like this online in literature, the example that I've just shown to you was completely fake. And so, I want to ask you a question. I want you to ask yourself one question. What if I hadn't told you that the example was fake? What if I didn't tell you that this example was created with the technology that my talk today is going to be about, artificial intelligence, or AI. And I want you to remember the answer to that question until the end of my talk. Because today, what I'm trying to do is prove to you that everything you think you knew about media is about to change, and it's going to change very quickly. And so, I want to start with a little history. This tool, DALI, in April 2022, the company OpenAI released this software. And for the first time in history, suddenly a child or anyone was able to create an original meaningful piece of art simply by entering text into an input line like we know from Google, for example. But this time, the, the difference was that the image that came out of the system was original. So in the beginning, we were very fascinated with this. We could tell the tool, create us an image of two teddy bears flying to the moon in the style of Vincent van Gogh. And it came out with an image of two teddy bears flying to the moon in the style of Vincent van Gogh. And now, one year later, and thanks to our newly gained understanding of these tools, and thanks to massive progress during one year, we are able to create almost any photorealistic graphics that we can think of. And we can do this in the blink of an eye. And so, I want to show you a few examples of what I mean. Take a look at this, for example. These people, these locations where they are sitting at, they don't exist. This is art from my friend Julie Wieland, and she's specialized in cinematography that was made by machines. These Polaroid images, the people you see there, these people never existed. These children never played in these flower fields. These 80s, they never existed. Take this. These are actual photographies. <laughs> but these are their AI-generated variations. So we can not only generate new images, but we can also take existing ones and transform them into something new that looks similar to them. We shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. And so, we are now moving from the photographic age into the syntographic age. Photography meant drawing with light. Syntography means drawing synthetically or artificially. 
And this woman, let's call her Haley, to make it a bit more emotional, she does not exist. And even though she looks like a normal girl or a normal woman, she does not exist in the real world. She was entirely created, entirely generated by machines simply through a few prompt inputs. And so we can definitely say that we are moving into a new industrial era that we refer to, to the gen as the generative age. The age where machines will be the ones that write stories, that generate stories, that generate images, videos, text, and any other kind of data that we can think of. And what I found interesting when Dali came out last year, which was in April, and during summer people got access to the tool, and in summer we had generated like thousands ima of, Im of images already with Dali, and I was telling my friends about it, and they seemed rather unimpressed. The most common question I got was, yeah, but does it go to Google to find these images? And that was because people did not understand that these images were in fact original. There was no precedent for a technology so powerful like this one. And it was only later when another tool by the same company came out, ChatGPT, that people started to understand. That they started to understand that machines were now creative and that they could ask for anything they could think of, and the machine would generate something for them. And this was a very strange moment, um, because back then, the f most common reaction that people had was first they were mind blown, and I'm sure some of you have the same reaction today. First they were mind blown, but then they got scared. And for me, it was no different. I thought the machine that could replace me, that would, could replace me in my job, had finally arrived. And so in summer that year, I had a dream. And I want to share this dream with you today. And I posted the dream on Twitter, and I visualized the dream using the exact tools that I'm talking about. And so here's my dream. Imagine it's the 19th century. We were standing in front of this factory gate, and people were angry. They were angry at Dali, and they wanted to destroy it. And so we broke in through the factory gate onto the factory site, and we went looking for Dali. We wanted to kill it. And once we got in, we entered a building. And in my dream, in that building, there was an entirely white room. There was nothing inside. Dali wasn't there. And so we took our hammers, which I find very symbolic, because the hammer is basically the oldest tool that we have, and we started smashing the walls. But no matter how many walls we smashed, we could not find Dali. And then I realized, Dali was not a robot. Dali was not a computer. Dali was no industrial device that we could destroy. But Dali was in fact invisible. And then I woke up. And when I woke up, I knew that if I wanted to compete with this thing, if I wanted to really understand this thing, then I would need to keep going and work with these tools and not against them. Because it would not be the tool by itself that would replace me, but it would be another human using the tool. And that's my advice for any creatives in the creative industry, in the digital creative industry most of all, is that the future belongs to the primates with the best tools. So don't be afraid, don't be a monkey and ignore these things, because these things will come. And the big question is, what does this mean for the industry?
What does this mean, especially for the service industry here in Luxembourg? In Luxembourg, we have 90% of our workforce, which is in services. And many of these services, they are digital already. And during prior industrial revolutions, we automated most physical tasks. And these big machines that we have, they don't get tired, they don't go to sleep, they don't complain, they don't strike. Maybe they run out of oil or gas or electricity, but our calculators don't miscalculate. And to give you one example of how powerful these machines are, imagine you have this computer at home, small personal computer. On an average PC like this, you can generate more than 5,000 images per day. So the social media manager of the future, or anybody who wants to create digital content, what this person is going to do is it's going to tell the PC what it needs. It's going to tell it, for example, I need a picture of my product in this and this setting. It's going to click the button. It's gonna, the person will go out of the house, do the groceries, go visit their grandmother, and at the end of the day, they're going to come back home and the machine will have generated thousands of images for them. And all they have to do is curate the results, select a few good ones, and post them online. And so, we have a, a strange situation that is developing here because these tools, they are incredibly powerful sparing partners. They have the potential to completely change the service industry. Microsoft, for example, has statistics that show that programmers who use their software called Copilot are 55% more efficient than developers that don't. 55%. That's every second developer in a company replaced by AI or by a person using AI. And so, because these machines are so powerful and because these new calculators can generate so much stuff, we need to ask a few more questions. But first, let me ask you, do you know where the word computer comes from? The word computer was used back in the days, uh, I'm a millennial, I wouldn't know, but back in the days, the word computer was used to describe people that could calculate. That's where the word comes from. Being a computer was a job. And so when back in the days we were happy that computers and calculators could calculate for us, today we are happy that new machines can tell us stories and be created for us or rather with us. So we have this weird situation where the value, the economic value of information and knowledge will trend towards zero. Because these machines, we're gonna use them to generate new information and we're gonna use them to interpret the information that they themselves have created for us. And the question is, where do we fit? Where do we fit in this loop where machines create information and evaluate the information that they themselves have created. Because the autonomous, the generative age brings autonomous information generation and interpretation. And I call this the infinite information loop. And that's where we fit. That's where we fit in the middle of the loop, in the eye of the storm, if you will. That's where we will provide our feedback to the machines from. And therefore, we need new paradigms for media, art, culture, and all these other things that we thought were so important to our history. The internet of tomorrow must be considered a priori fake, which means fake first. Don't believe everything you see on the internet becomes don't believe anything unless someone somehow proves to you that something is actually real. I want to leave you with a final quote, not from Marshall McLuhan, but uh, from the HBO series Westworld. 
for those of you that haven't seen Westworld, Westworld is this fake world where everything that people experience is part of a larger story. It's a world built somewhere in the desert by some genius scientist. And in Westworld, when one of the protagonists arrives, at some point he gets confused. And he asks the host, are you real? And she replies, well, if you can't tell, does it matter? If you can't tell, does it matter? Think about that for a second. And then remember the question that I asked you at the very beginning. If you can't tell, does it matter? Now I'm not going to leave you like this, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> there's actually one other question that we, uh, that we need to ask. And this question is incredibly important, and I think we have such a huge opportunity here that we need to grasp. And this other question that we need to ask is, where does it matter? And the answer to that, at the end of the day, everything only ever matters in the real world. Our world. And the opportunity that we have is that finally, we may be able to liberate ourselves from our media shackles. Our adventures in the real world may become more relevant to us again, not less, thanks to new AI tools. We may finally stop trying to fake our own happiness online. We may finally stop competing for our most valuable resource, which is time, our attention and time. So I believe that if we've played this right, if we use these tools in the right way, we will continue to shape our tools more than they shape us. Thank you. <laughs>